This is a production of Cornell University. So what I really did at Cornell uh, was be involved in the Lettuce Project, and this is an, uh, a picture of, of uh, one of the setups that, that we looked at. And the idea was, it was funded by the, uh, the NYSEC, the, the local power company, uh, NYSERDA, and at the time ESERCO, uh, Energy Research and Development Corporation, I think it was. Um, they were interested in selling more power, more electricity. And, and we, of course, felt that if you want to grow a crop in a relatively dark environment in upstate New York, you can only do that successfully if you add lots of supplemental lighting. So we picked lettuce, and I, I don't remember anymore exactly why we picked lettuce. We thought at the time, I think, that it was a great idea because it was a so-called simple crop to grow that turned out not to be the case. We picked lettuce, um, and uh, the, the objective of the work was to try to grow it as fast as possible so have minimal uh, time in the greenhouse, and also have it finished <coughs> in the same period of time. So in the independent of the weather conditions, we wanted to have the lettuce finish at the same uh, date. So the, the number of days it took from seeding to harvesting was always supposed to be the same in our system. So you have to keep that in mind when you think about our, our uh, system and the approach that we took. The reasons, of course, is that greenhouse uh, space is very expensive, and. Uh, and so you need to get the crop in and out quickly. And we couldn't wait, uh, particularly when you think about uh, changing lighting conditions, we couldn't wait. We didn't afford ourselves to wait uh, and grow a crop over more days when the light conditions were not favorable. So supplemental lighting was used. And you see here the setup that we used uh, using high pressure sodium lamps in a specifically designed array to get high uniformity and the highest intensity possible uh, given uh, the limited resource in terms of electricity that we wanted to use for, for growing this crop. So one of the, the results of that work was, here you see uh, a graph that shows you the accumulated light conditions uh, since seeding on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis you see the shoot dry mass or shoot dry weight. And you get a very nice uh, linear line, uh, not surprising when you think about a crop like lettuce that is a vegetative crop. So there's not really all that much uh, uh, significant about this graph except for the fact that you're looking at 35 data points and each of those data points was a single treatment and each treatment started with about 800 seeds. So the, the, the amount of work that went into uh, giving you this graph, this, this very nice linear relationship, uh, was quite significant and many people were involved in this effort and it took many, many uh, hours of work to, to get all these data points for this graph. Another thing we looked at was, was leaf area versus uh, uh, the horizontal axis few, uh, shoot fresh mass. And on the other, uh, on the right hand side on the, uh, the vertical axis, we looked at uh, dry mass. So we got nice correlations between leaf area and, and uh, shoot fresh mass as well as the dry mass and the, and the fresh mass. Again, not particularly surprising, except I wanna mention that if you look at the blue line, you see a very nice linear relationship between dry mass and fresh mass. And this resulted very quickly in significant discussions with, particularly with Professor Langhans, because the staff obviously was more interested in taking the fresh mass and not do the tedious uh, dry weight measurements, dry mass measurements. Uh, but he stood his grounds and, and we lost out. And so we did continue uh, weighing uh, plants after they went through the drying cycle. And, and, uh, and we had to do a lot of extra work because of that. But to his credit, that also meant that we had better results in the end and more publishable results uh, uh, when we were done. So everything was going nice and smoothly until we hit a significant problem. And th the problem was called tip burn. And tip burn is a physiological disorder. And I, again, I'm an engineer, so you have to uh, ask the plant physiologist for more specific details. But my understanding is that it is caused by a calcium deficiency. The plant is growing very rapidly. Uh, and calcium is not taken up quickly enough by the roots and not taken to the young, uh, rapidly expanding leaf tissue. And as a result, we see die back of that leaf tissue and you get a, a lettuce plant that looks much like this. And of course, although you get the dry weight accumulation, you can't sell the plant because nobody in their right mind would go to Wegmans and buy this, this head of lettuce. So we, we were stuck. We were trying to push the plants as fast as we could uh, to try to get them out of the greenhouse as quickly as possible, um, but we didn't reach 
Uh, we couldn't grow them past a certain point because we started seeing this tip burn issue from happening. So we had many discussions about uh, what we could do about it. We, we looked at papers and we found a paper uh, from colleagues in, in Japan that actually blew uh, air on lettuce plants to try to increase plant transpiration and therefore increase the, the, the uptake and transport of calcium from the roots to the young growing tips and they seem to have some success. And so we talked about how we could do this, envisioning a large greenhouse set up with little tubes that were blowing air on individual heads of lettuce. And we quickly realized that this was not going to work in a practical uh, system. So I mentioned here, we did a covert experiment. Uh, and covert, I have to explain, was because Professor Langhans was out of town at the time. <laughs> and. and um, we had discussed this idea, but I think he wasn't very much in favor of it. And so uh, we took the opportunity. I think he was either uh, at a conference or he was uh, going for his winter break in, in Florida. And so we took that opportunity to put something together very simply, an, an inflated plastic tube with little holes along the side, positioned directly overhead, uh, two rows of lettuce plants. And we, we grew the, the plants and looked at the results. And much to our surprise, the the idea worked perfectly. In, in, in fact, the plants that received additional air supply with this system did not get any tip burn, where neighboring plants did have significant amount of tip burn. And so after we saw the result ourselves, we could uh, report back to Professor Langhans when he came back from his trip or from his vacation, uh, that indeed we discovered that uh, this was a great idea and we should investigate more. And so he then quickly told us then uh, to use turbulator fans, overhead fans that could blow large amounts of air uh, vertically down on the lettuce crop to help increase plant transpiration and overcome this, this tip burn issue. Uh, and so this is what we, we started doing and this is how we overcome the tip burn issue, issue but to a certain extent. And that certain extent is, I'm trying to show you here in this graph, where on the horizontal axis you look at uh, dry mass accumulation, on the vertical axis you look at water use. We carefully tracked water use of plants in our system. And we could come up with uh, uh, these lines. And these are uh, uh, regression lines. So they're they not the actual data, but the result of the, the data that we collected to try to uh, polish up the graph a little bit. But you can see here, there's different uh, light treatments that uh, have different rates of, of uh, water use as the plants are growing through the different uh, stages to final harvest. And so we surmised from this graph that, that you needed to have a minimum rate of water use or plant transpiration uh, in order to overcome this tip burn problem. You can see in the top of the slide that treatments up to 16 moles of light or so did not uh, suffer from tip burn, where treatments above that, 20 and 22 moles in the bottom, um, did receive or did uh, experience uh, tip burn issues. So this is why, uh, if you've been uh, at all familiar with the CEA program, this is why we typically recommend that 16 to 70 moles of light is the, is the limit uh, using the Cornell system for growing lettuce um, bec because of this tip burn issue and because of the fact that if you use additional measures to increase plant transpiration like these turbulator fans, um, we can overcome tip burn, but only to a certain extent if you still try to push the plants even harder, you do get the dry mass accumulation, but you don't get, you don't overcome the tip burn issue. We also dabbled in, in CO2 experiments where we enrich the environment. And I, I say trading here with quotes. And what I mean with that, I, I want to explain with this graph. If you look on the uh, vertical axis, you see the, the shoot dry mass again. And you see a dark line, a, a black line at, at seven grams. And that's the the target weight that we were trying to shoot for. That corresponds, if you go back to the <laughs> linear relationship between fresh mass and, and dry mass, that, that corresponds to a fresh mass of approximately 150 grams, which was the target mass we were trying to shoot for. So the seven grams is our target uh, size of plant that we are trying to shoot for. Um, and if you look then at the, the different light intensities <coughs> indicated by different <coughs> colored lines here, and you follow that seven gram line uh, from left to right, you see it intersects with the 17 moles first at approximately ambient CO2 concentrations. Of course, this is 20 years ago when CO2 concentration ambient was still around 350. Right now it's approaching 400. Um, but as you go further to the right, you see that that horizontal line at seven grams intersects with different 
lines of, of light intensity, and they correspond to different CO2 concentrations if you look at the horizontal axis. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that we found out that if instead of growing the plants at 17 moles at ambient CO2 concentrations, you could also grow a plant at 12 moles where you had to increase the, the CO2 concentration to approximately 1,300 or so micromoles per moles or, or parts per million. And this is what I mean by trading. We discovered that within limits, you could decide instead of adding more supplemental lighting, which is very expensive, you could, you could add or increase the CO2 concentration and get the same end result. And so this was an interesting uh, discovery. And, and I think uh, when you think about commercial production, this can have some significant implications because obviously it will be cheaper to add CO2 compared to adding uh, supplemental lighting. And then all that work resulted in uh, a set of uh, growth curves. We used a second order exponential polynomial. You see the equation in the box upright. Um, where we only have one uh, variable, the, the daily light integral, the amount of light we provided on a daily basis to the plants. So we provide that light every day to try to keep the plants at their fixed growing rate to make sure we reach the target uh, harvest date. And you can see here for different daily light integrals uh, what the growth curve looked like uh, for the varieties that we were using at the time, which was Ostinata bib lettuce. We also looked at efficiency uh, rates, uh, so how much energy do you need to provide and, and what do you get in return in terms of biomass. And more recently I, I found a paper by Monteith in from 1977 that looked at uh, efficiency rates in terms of the amount of light that was intercepted versus the dry matter production. Um, and he looked at, at outdoor crops. He, he looked at apples, barley, potatoes and sugar beets and you see these colored lines here indicating uh, the data that he found. And then from this data, I can calculate an, an, an average efficiency, taking to into account that the heat of combustion for dry matter is approximately 70 and a half kilojoules per gram. So I could look at the energy that you provided through sunlight versus the uh, energy that you, you gain from uh, dry matter production, and then you can calculate an efficiency. And then the little blue line uh, towards the origin of the graph here is, is the line for our lettuce plants. And now you think that it looks like the lettuce is not doing so well, but you have to keep in mind that the lettuce uh, crops that we were growing only required a 24-day time period in the greenhouse. We grew it for 11 days in the growth chamber and then 24 more days in the, in the uh, greenhouse. So after 35 days or five weeks, the plants were finished and we reached the 150 gram fresh matter, uh, fresh weight uh, target harvest size. So if you, if you think about this, the outdoor crops can be grown only once in the outdoor season, but the greenhouse crops can be grown actually 15 times in the same area in a greenhouse. So multiply both axes by 15 and you see that uh, the greenhouse crop was doing uh, significantly better than the, than the field crops. As I mentioned, we did lots of experiments. Uh, some were funny and some were uh, informative. Uh, one of them that I liked particularly uh, was this continuous production, in this case in NFT or nutrient film technique, um, l showing you the, the visual growth curve. I showed you the lines that we, that we calculated from the data that we collected. Here you see actually in a vis visual representation, an actual representation of what that growth curve looks like. So every day we would plant a new row and move the rows up until we finally ended up with a, a complete uh, picture of what the every stage of the, the, the production looked like. We did the same for floating uh, systems. Uh, in the meantime, we had visited a grower in Canada that was using this floating system, and we, we quickly realized the benefits of this system. And, and so we started working uh, on floating systems as well. And here you see the same idea, a, a visual representation of the growth curve uh, of lettuce plants in that floating system. And then eventually, uh, and I'm sure everybody here is familiar with us, we were able to, and I, think st I still think this is very remarkable, out of the research that we did, uh, and this is to the credit of Professors uh, Langhans and, and Albright, they were able to convince our, our sponsors that it was a good idea to build a demonstration facility. And I, th I don't think there are many uh, research projects that ultimately end up in a, in a significantly scaled demonstration facility in which we were going to demonstrate that this lettuce uh, production system was going to work out. 
And that, at that stage, uh, the professor retired and I, and I left Cornell uh, for, for Rutgers University. So I'm switching now to uh, some of the work that I've been involved with at Rutgers University. And you quickly can see that I'm switching to a totally different crop. Um, Rutgers is, is more known for their work on tomatoes. So when I came there, I had to switch my thinking from a, a vegetative crop to a, a flowering crop like, like tomatoes. And this is not a particularly good picture of a tomato plant, but it has one feature that I wanted you to look at, which is the fact that the stem here is, is cut. And, and the Rutgers approach was a different approach from the traditional tomato production system in the sense that they decided to grow single cluster or dual cluster uh, tomato plants. And that meant that at after the first fruit cluster had started to develop, they would break off the, uh, the, the growing tip uh, and, and let the plant put all its resources into, into uh, the, the few fruit that it was developing uh, before the plant was then discarded. So the cropping cycle was much reduced in terms of time. Uh, but also the spacing was much increased. We could pack these plants much closer together uh, in the system that we were looking at. And at least theoretically, it appeared that a system like this would be as productive as the more traditional lean and lower system that, is, that you can see in, in most uh, commercial greenhouse operations. So I'm switching to a uh, tomato crop. Some of the early work was funded by NASA. Uh, this is, uh, is also a, a bit of a contentious point uh, with the Cornell group here. At the time, uh, Rutgers had a, an NSCORE project, an, an, a uh, NASA-funded project, where Cornell also uh, uh, was in the running and, and trying to get the funding, but it, it went to Rutgers at the time. And so um, by leaving here, I lucked out and, and, and ended up being part of that, that uh, the winning effort at Rutgers, although I, when I was here at, uh, at Cornell, I was at the losing end because we didn't get the funding. But anyway, uh, from a NASA point of view, uh, and you have to think now about growing crops for space applications where you, if you do long duration space missions, you, you want to be able to provide your crew with, with uh, nutritious food and it's probably not likely that you can bring, uh, as, that it's economical to bring all your food with you, so you have to produce as you are traveling, for example, to Mars. Uh, it becomes important to know more about these crops and so NASA was interested in funding some research and, and looking at these crops. and so. What we discovered when we looked at this and when we started working in this area that if you, if you look at uh, published work, in most cases people have, have looked at tomato production extensively, but the conditions under which the tomatoes were grown under were always kept constant. In other words, you had certain set points that you typically followed to, to produce a crop. And, and NASA, of course, was interested in, in, in developing growth models that they can then use to try to simulate what the production might be when you fly a system like that in space because they wanted to start planning how much food they could count on for the crews that they were planning to take with them. And so we needed to have uh, growth models for those particular applications, but we also knew that in the NASA system uh, it might not be inconceivable that there were perturbations to those environmental conditions because, for example, the power that was required to run the lights was needed for another critical component in their, in their uh, system. And so the perturbations were really important. And, and we knew that, that the perturbation studies were not done very extensively, certainly not on tomato crops. And then by talking to our specialists on tomato crops, we knew that uh, the environmental conditions, environmental conditions during flowering and fruit set were really important. And that starts around 55 days after seeding for the particular system that we were using. So those conditions, if you, if you do perturbations in that time period, and it, it, for our case, it was about a two-week time period, then that can have significant impact on, on the quality and the, and the yield of the plants. And we also looked at harvesting the plants at the typical breaker stage, which for a tomato plant means that the color is just changing from green to, to slightly orange or pinkish. Um, and as harvesting at a later date, because we felt uh, and uh, we had indications that if you wait longer, you get better quality aspects of your, of your fruit production. And so indeed, as you can see on the bottom point here, um, we did find that there were significant improvements if you wait longer uh, before you start harvesting the fruit, which is ob obviously not a, a major um, uh, surprise, but it was, it was nice that we could now have a quantitative way of, of uh, showing this. 
So the work was done in, in gross chambers mostly, uh, so very familiar to the gross chambers that you use at Cornell here. Um, we, we used a lot of mylar screening around our plant stands to try to overcome the issue of site lighting. So typically you would have site lighting issues and you would remove uh, plants on the outside rows from your experiments, but since we had limited area, we wanted to include those plants, so we used those screens to, to try to overcome the side light issue. And um, the, the way we did it, we started plants all in the same growth chamber, and then uh, depending on the treatment, they were moved to different uh, growth chambers to, to receive their treatment. So of course there are issues associated with when you start moving plants, you, you disturb them, you stress them, and, and we had to take that into account. So it was not a, a particularly easy uh, thing to do, uh, but we made the best of, of the resources that we had available. And for those of you insiders in control environment uh, work, you can see here that we used fluorescent lamps and incandescent lamps, and knowing from my time at Cornell that, that the use of incandescent lamp is somewhat contentious, and I tried really hard to convince my colleagues that, that we should not be using them, uh, but I, I lost, obviously, that argument, and so, um, this is perhaps an institutional and historical artifact that we still use uh, incandescent lamps for, uh, for tomato production. Switching to a different project, but still staying with the same crop, uh, just like many other uh, universities, including Cornell, uh, we were interested in high tunnel production, the growers were interested in it particularly, and uh, we got some seed money from our uh, college to investigate high tunnel production and we looked at um, different sites. We installed them in different places across the state to look at uh, different weather conditions. Uh, we looked at different orientations. We looked at uh, tunnels with manual roll-up sites. We looked at tunnels with automatic roll-up sites, which meant you had to have a, a motorized system with a thermostat that would operate the, uh, the roll-up sites. We looked at different mulches, different colored mulches for tomato production. And, and as you can see in the bottom here, we wrote an article um, looking at additional uh, control measures such as an energy curtain uh, that you would pull over the crop at night to try to uh, maintain the temperature a little bit longer uh, at optimum conditions or at least at, at, at good growing conditions. Um, as a side note, I think uh, we, we, of course, Penn State is really heavy and really big in high tunnel research. Uh, we have been doing a little bit of it. Uh, I know that Cornell is, is doing a lot of work in it too. It seems to me that across the region there's should be more collaboration among the various institutions to try to, uh, to not duplicate efforts because I think some of that is going on at these institutions. When I came to Rutgers, I inherited uh, a greenhouse shell, uh, so it wasn't looking as nice as it looks in this picture. Uh, my predecessor uh, was able to get funding for uh, the framework of a uh, open roof greenhouse system, which is a newer design that allows for large amounts of air exchange to try to keep the temperature inside pretty much the same as outdoor conditions in the summertime, um, which is typically not feasible when you use mechanical ventilation systems. But if you have these open roof greenhouses, you can uh, get to uh, those conditions. So we, we uh, quickly uh, realized we needed to improve this facility to get it up to a research grade facility. And, and Jean Rees, uh, my graduate student and um, a technician at the time, uh, did, a, did the yeoman's work of getting this, uh, this facility in, in great shape uh, to do experimentation. And as you can see from the, the reference here, he also looked into uh, a, a, a heating system, a floor heating system, uh, and, and look at the benefits of floor heating for, for crop production. So here you see uh, the inside of the greenhouse. It's a, an ebb and flood floor system, which is a very nice way of irrigating your crop if you can grow them in pots and sit them directly on the floor. And then embedded in that concrete layer, uh, we installed a heating system, a, a, a plastic pipe system through which we pump uh, hot water. And the way that system was designed is shown in this uh, graphic. So you have your concrete slab, you have the heating pipes, and you have also the uh, the, the supply and drainage system for your irrigation system that it ends up in an underground storage tank um, where you store your nutrient solution to be ready for the next uh, irrigation cycle. So the top of the floor was carefully designed so it had a good drainage system. We, we call it a W shape. We had two rows of holes down the length of the, the bay uh, that collect the nutrient solution after the irrigation cycle 
and then drains it back into the tank and we pump the nutrient solution through the same system back up onto the floor when the plants require water. As I mentioned, Gene did a lot of work on, on the developing a numerical model, and this is of course engineering uh, talk, uh, to look at uh, how the heat is distributed in, in these systems. And here you see a, a section of a floor slab um, as the box, the bar, and then some red dots indicating the location of the heating pipes, and the colors are indicating the different temperatures uh, at a particular moment in the simulation run. So you get an idea of the type of work we did uh, using that system. Some of the results of those simulations are shown in this graph, where on the horizontal axis you look at the supply water temperature, <coughs> and it's, it's not likely that you will ever go as high as 55 or 60 degrees, because at that temperature you will likely cook the crop that sits on the floor, but you might go as high as about 50 degrees or so. Uh, but what we're looking at here is how much heat is actually coming off the surface, the top surface of the floor, and how much heat is going uh, is directed towards the, the bottom uh, or the, the under layer, the under layer of ground underneath the floor, uh, represented by the, the blue lines, uh, because we were interested in the question, do you need to insulate underneath a concrete floor to try to prevent heat from escaping to the outside that you can't use for uh, heating your greenhouse environment? And then in addition to that, we looked at, and we could do this of course because we had a simulation model, we looked at two different uh, pipe designs, one where we used three quarter inch pipes at, uh, s at 12 inch spacings, or we used, which is more common these days, a half inch diameter pipe at nine inch spacings. So these are just design features that you can incorporate in your floor heating system. And you see there are some differences the, 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 uh, between, between those two uh, conditions. But more importantly, I think what I'm trying to show you here is that about approximately 10% of the heat that we were able to supply in this floor heating system would end up in the soil underneath. And then the remaining 90% of the heat would actually end up in the, in, the, in the greenhouse environment. And so based upon that fact, we can now start looking at uh, recommending to growers to install an insulating layer underneath the floor to try to prevent that. Of course, when the floor is, or the, the ground underneath the floor is relatively dry, Dry soil is not a very good heat conductor. Uh, you may not need the insulation, but if you have a wet soil, where uh, particularly if the soil moisture is, is in movement continuously, uh, you can significantly lose heat uh, from underneath the floor, and therefore, in those cases, a layer of insulation might be very uh, desirable. And then the next step uh, we took is, uh, I showed you the diagram of the, the simulated slab. We simulated a layer of soil on that slab, simulating uh, plug production. And we looked at the temperature distribution uh, in that layer of soil, that simulated layer of soil, at different heights. So you see the temperature scale on the left-hand side. Uh, and so the, the bottom uh, green lines represent the highest location in that two-inch layer of soil that is sitting directly on the floor. And the, the, the blue lines, the top lines, uh, represent the location closest to the floor. And you can see here, for the two different designs, where you have the 12-inch spacings with a little bit bigger pipe or the little bit smaller pipe at the shorter spacing of nine inches, represented by the R's and the S, the return and the supply lines in the bottom of the graph. You can see here that the peaks uh, are, uh, coincide with where the supply lines are installed and the valleys are represented with where the return lines are installed. So that, that all matches up. But what is more important, I think, is to look at the fluctuation. So even though we have a very uniform heating system, with the, the simulation model, we could now start calculating exactly what the temperature would be in our simulated soil layer. And we could, from that, could, could make some assessment of whether these fluctuating temperatures will have an impact on, on plant production. Another project I'm involved with is a, a microturbine project, and a microturbine is nothing more than a jet engine in a box. It's a stationary jet engine, um, and it works on the same principle. We provide it with gas, um, and um, it combusts the gas, and, it, and as a result, it drives a turbine uh, that generates electricity. We can use the, the electricity on site, or we can export the electricity to the grid, or we can do a combination of the two. So we're using landfill gas. Uh, landfill gas was initially just uh, let go. Uh, as, as the landfill is closed and, and uh, bacteria break down the refuge, um, methane gas is produced. 
that methane gas initially was just let go to the environment, but we quickly realized that uh, that contributed significantly to greenhouse gases, and now nationwide we have legislation that you can't do that anymore. You have to burn the gas, um, at least that's what's been done up until now. Mostly, most recently, that's, that means they flared it, but of course then you waste it. You convert it to a still a greenhouse gas, CO2, which is less of a greenhouse gas than methane gas, less <coughs> potent. Um, so from that point of view, it's good, but of course you waste that energy. And so we tapped into that resource and, and desi designed this, uh, this microturbine system. The challenge is if you use landfill gas, it's not as clean as natural gas, and so you need to clean it up in, in order not to do damage to the, uh, some of the critical components of the, of the turbine system. And so we need to remove sulfur gas, and you see two large cylinders here that contain a uh, proprietary material uh, that probably uh, contains a lot of iron filings that is able to strip out uh, passively the, the sulfur gas, the sulfur. And, and then we go through a, a, a compression cycle and a refrigeration cycle to collect uh, the moisture in the gas, but also, more importantly, the siloxane chemicals, a group of chemicals based on silicate that, is, that can be very uh, detrimental to engine components. So we, we, we collect those, we take them out, and then the remainder of the gas is clean enough to be combusted in the, uh, the microturbine system. And you can see here it was a relatively expensive uh, undertaking, uh, about a three quarters of a million dollar unit, um, but it generates a, a fair amount of electricity that we can use for the supplemental lighting system in the greenhouse. And if we, we don't need that, we can export it to the grid and get a fairly decent price for, for the electricity that way. Um, it is commissioned, as I show here, in 2008, and we have some uh, long-term data uh, operating it now. I can't take any credit for this, but, but because I started talking about energy, I wanted to show you that we have some progressive growers in the state of New Jersey as well as we have in, in, in New York. This grower uh, was using uh, oil, fuel oil, as a, as a uh, fuel source for his greenhouse operation that's about seven acres. And um, because of the, the increases in oil prices, he is not, no longer able to uh, economically uh, use that fuel source to, to run his operation. So he switched over uh, to biomass energy, and he wants to eventually get to a point where he's using uh, um, miscanthus or, or switchgrass as the biomass feedstock for, for his operation. So he has 200 acres on site that he, he's planning to convert to miscanthus and, and uh, switchgrass. Uh, in the meantime, he's using wood pellets. And so you can see here what wood pellets look like, and you see the truck delivering the wood pellets to two large silos, and then from the silos it get augured, gets augured into a, a boiler system that he uses to, uh, to run his operation. So we see a lot of growers struggling with the energy uh, issue, and, and here's an example of how a progressive grower was able to um, convert uh, from, f from fuel oil to, to biomass oil. The only challenge is, and he's still fighting this a little bit, is that um, because of his, his combusting uh, biomass, he now has to deal with new air regulations from our state DEP. Uh, air quality issue is, is, is important in New Jersey. We have, uh, we have issues with that, and so our DEP is very uh, strict about that. So the permitting issues associated with the, the conversion from his oil system to this biomass system, although realistically there are not that many more um, uh, contributing components that he is uh, releasing into the environment, just a permitting issue because he has a biomass type combustion system has been, have been very uh, challenging for him. Are those mainly particulates or? Yeah, yeah. We also started to dabble a little bit in LED lighting. Uh, I got a little seed grant from the college. And as you can see here, uh, in a very simplistic way, uh, we had a, a very little money in that seed funding. Uh, we purchased a bunch of off-the-shelf screw-in type uh, LED bulbs and uh, started to grow some tomato plants. And you can see here, as the tomato plants are getting taller and getting close to the lamps, you see certain areas that are clearly red and clearly blue, the two colors that are typically used uh, to try to improve uh, plant growth and development. And um, obviously, this is not an ideal situation, but as an interesting side note, and maybe this means something, maybe it doesn't, uh, the two 
uh, tomatoes that you see here, one growing mostly under blue light and the other one growing mostly under red light, were not different from each other. So the quality aspects and, the, and the, the production aspects were not different. They were obviously on the same plant, but they were getting, for a significant amount of time, a uh, significantly different color light uh, provided to them. And then before I move on, I should say that uh, I, I have, I'm participating now in a much larger effort looking at uh, LED systems for, for greenhouse uh, production uh, with a group of people uh, from different universities, Kerry Mitchell at Purdue uh, and others at Purdue, uh, Eric Runkel in Michigan State, uh, the group of Gene Giacomelli and Cherry Kubota at Arizona, and, and myself at Rutgers. We are we're trying to look at uh, a comprehensive study, both from the plant aspect as from the engineering aspect, on what we need in terms of LED lighting systems for, for the greenhouse industry. And I also was involved um, for many years now with an international committee that looked at guidelines for control environments. Uh, if you work in control environments, you realize that uh, when, you, when you read the literature, uh, people not always report all the critical uh, uh, environmental parameters that they need to report in order for you to understand, uh, at least get a detailed understanding of the experiments, and also uh, for you to be able to replicate that experiment. And so we have for many years with an international group looked at developing guidelines. And here you see the example for experiments in growth rooms and growth chambers. Uh, uh, we have developed several of these guidelines now for growth rooms and growth chambers as well as for tissue culture facilities. And we're working on a, a guideline for, uh, for greenhouse production as well. And what we are really trying to get after is to have a, 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 a table like this where researchers can look at the different parameters that are important for plant production, which you see on the left-hand side here. They understand what units they need to use to measure those parameters correctly, where to measure those conditions, uh, when to measure them, and what to report, not only in their uh, reports to funding agency, but perhaps more importantly in their reports to the scientific community through papers and, uh, and presentations. So this is an ongoing effort, and although it's a, a fairly thankless effort, I think it's an important effort because hopefully it'll bring the entire research community uh, more in line with each other so that we can better understand and use each other's results. Then moving on to my sabbatic in the Netherlands, and here you see a pretty picture of uh, one of their greenhouse facilities that is growing roses. Uh, I think if you want to see rose production in the Netherlands, you should be quick because I think, just like in the United States, um, the costs are, are prohibitive uh, and are getting, it's getting more and more difficult for growers to continue this, this type of business. And so I wouldn't be surprised that in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, the entire rose production uh, would disappear from the Netherlands. I, I uh, worked with uh, my old department, the Ag Engineering Department, uh, called now the Farm Technology Group, which has become part of the Plant Sciences Group. And for those of you who, who know a little bit about the Netherlands, uh, the way their system is set up is quite differently than we have our system here and, and in the United States. And so I wanted to take a few minutes to explain a little bit how their system operates and how it's put together. Uh, the Plant Sciences Group consists of the university, Wageningen University and Research Center, WUR, and then the Plant Sciences Group in particular. There's also a group called the Plant Research International and the Applied Plant Research Group, or PPO. So all these F entities, the university, uh, the, the, the former extension, uh, government research facilities are all combined in a sort of convoluted uh, organization uh, called the Plant Sciences Group. Um, you see the locations, the main locations, as well as their field trial stations. And I wanted to give you some sense of the, the value of the horticulture industry in the Netherlands. And particularly for Bill Miller, I added bulbs as well. Hopefully my numbers are correct. But here you see uh, the, the, the monetary value of the exports, both to the world and as a subset of that within the European Union, uh, the export, the, 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 the dollar, the, 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 in this case the euro amounts, uh, associated with these exports. And I, for reference, I give you the, uh, the gross domestic products of the Netherlands. Uh, it's a, the, the contribution that horticulture is making to the country is very significant. And hence, perhaps the, 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 uh, the top position that, that the Netherlands uh, 
maintains up until today in this field. They have very nice new facilities. The, the organization in Wageningen has also completely changed. Uh, they are building an entirely new campus and the plant sciences group, as you can see here, has a very wonderful new facility with large uh, greenhouse operations as well. Um, so they really put a lot of effort into uh, getting people up to speed and, and having the world-class facility there. And then if you really wanted to know more about the specifics, this is uh, something I got out of a canned presentation by the Plant Sciences Group. They have four specific focus areas, sustainable production and climate change, plant-based materials, health, and systems biology. And you can read off under each of these four areas, the specific areas that they target at. These are the main areas that they try to focus their research on. So they are, they're not doing everything anymore for everybody. They have specifically targeted areas where they feel they can make a significant contribution. Unlike in the United States, in the Netherlands, um, they have a wonderful statistical service that collects many, many data points, not only for the greenhouse industry, but for many industries. And so there's a wealth of data available there about what the greenhouse industry is doing. And, and I wanted to show you uh, several sets of slides uh, indicating what the trends are, uh, because I think there are some very interesting trends going on and in very recent years. So I'm, you're looking here at three different years in 2000, 2005 and 2009. That was the last year I found data for. And you can, by the way, you can get this annual updated data yourself. You have to pay about 150 euros or so to get a nice book that contains many very interesting facts about the industry. Uh, so if you need this kind of data, I can, I can point you in the right direction. But what you're looking at here is the, the, the number of operations and the particular size of these operations. And, and if you look at the data carefully, then you see that all sizes are declining rapidly, except for the very largest size. So what you're seeing here is that uh, the number of, of uh, greenhouse operations is declining overall, but we see m uh, more of the remaining greenhouses become larger and larger. And this is a very recent development. It used to be that the average size was around a hectare in the Netherlands, and it was that for a long time. Uh, but now, in the last 10 years or so, you see, you see a significant change in that. So we get fewer companies, but the companies that are remaining are larger. And then I also separated out on the bottom here, comparing the, the vegetable versus the others, because the vegetables uh, obviously are, are of interest to myself. So. Um, we see the same trend in the vegetable production. The number of vegetable operations is significantly declining over the last 10 years, but the, the size of the individual operations is, is increasing and increasing quite substantially. If you look at the overall production area in the Netherlands, that has uh, remained the same, around 10,000 hectares. But again, you see some interesting changes in the, the first set of uh, bars. You see that the vegetable production is significantly increases. So is, uh, so is there an increase in flowering pot plants, but you see the cut flowers is significantly declining. And hence my comment earlier about the rose production, I think it, becomes, it is becoming too expensive uh, to grow cut flowers in the Netherlands. And, and so this is, this is why I think you won't see very many rose growers in the next 10 to 20 years anymore. If you look at the uh, Vegetable production, you see a similar uh, trend, although here we see an increase, particularly because of tomato increase and pepper increase. Um, and strawberries is mentioned here. Also, obviously, strawberry is not considered a vegetable, but for the Dutch industry, it's, the, it's one of the few uh, fruits that are grown in greenhouses, so for convenience, they're typically grouped in with vegetable production. So you see some of the vegetables are increasing, uh, others, others not so much. When you look at the cut flower and the pot plant area, we see again roses declining, chrysanthemums declining, and other crops declining. Uh, so overall, the cut flowers are declining, but the pot and bedding plants are, are keeping steady or perhaps slightly increasing. So again, it's, a, it's an interesting trend that is occurring. Comparing Holland to uh, one of the other EU countries where lots of greenhouse production is going on, that is Spain. Uh, you see here that the production in Spain, in terms of area, really dwarfs what's going on in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, so keep that in mind. And uh, keep in mind I'm talking about vegetable production here. One of the reasons is that, uh, of course, uh, if you look at a particular reason, the Al Almeria region in Spain, we see a, a very significant increase in the 
in the last 40 years or so in, in greenhouse production area in that particular location. This is the, the main factor why, why uh, Spain is, is so much, so much a more of a bigger producer compared to the Netherlands. And we see, we see uh, um, and as a result, of course, we see a shift in, in focus uh, when you look at the European Union in terms of where, where fruits and vegetables are produced. Auction prices are always interesting to look at, and, and what I really want you to take home from this slide is when you're looking at two different years and several types of tomatoes, round tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and on the vine tomatoes. But the, the, the challenge here, to, as we would have in the United States, is that you see significant fluctuations from year to year, and you see significant fluctuations uh, from season to season. So what we always hope for with our lettuce uh, system is that because we could deliver consistently there would be a consistent price associated with that consistent delivery that is not happening in the Netherlands. And it, it's not going to happen anytime soon in the Netherlands either, I think. So growers are forced to deal with this situation. As a result, it continues to be a very challenging uh, production system because some years you get a good price and some years you get a bad price. And how do you deal with that from an economic point of view? We see a lot of growers uh, using combined heat and power systems in the Netherlands. And that was historically because gas prices were relatively inexpensive. Uh, and so it made sense because they use lots of supplemental lighting and use more and more of it in the last decade or so. Um, these are expensive systems, um, but they were economical at the time. In fact, in 2010, about 12% of the national electricity consumption was produced by greenhouses. Well, think about that. That is a really a significant uh, contribution from these uh, um, individual systems installed at greenhouse operations. More recently, we see that the gas prices have increased because they are more tied to oil prices in, in, in Europe than they are here. And we see lots of growers getting in trouble because this system is no longer as profitable as it used to be. So they have these expensive systems installed. They have multi-year uh, projections for how they're going to pay them back. And all of a sudden, uh, the situation changes, the gas prices is more expensive than they anticipated, electricity prices have not gone up as high as they had hoped, and as a result they get into trouble. Keeping with the theme of, of lighting, uh, we, and I've, I've looked at lighting systems in the Netherlands, and this is the, the latest uh, approach that they are taking, intercanopy lighting using LED systems, not only LED lighting but still maintaining overhead high pressure sodium lighting to grow a crop. Whether this is the, the ultimate approach, I'm not so sure, but at least this is the latest uh, technology, latest uh, state of the art, which they are trying out and, and they're claiming they're getting good results, although I haven't seen many published uh, uh, publications about this yet. There was a, a food safety issue that I wanted to mention that happened just before we came, um, an E. coli infestation, and it had significant implications in, in, uh, in the, on the industry. It turned out to be a, a fenugreek seed that was imported from, from Egypt that was grown on an organic farm in Germany. But it took several weeks to discover the cause of, of the infestation and as a result what they needed to, be, to do about it. And in the meantime, many other crops were implicated as the source for this food contamination. And as a result, uh, the entire production came to a grinding halt. Uh, lots of fruits and vegetables had to be discarded. And as a result, uh, many growers got into severe financial uh, difficulty. And in fact, uh, we see a, a, a large number of uh, greenhouse operations that had to shut down uh, and close completely as a result of this, this food scare. So this is just a, a precaution. We have had these food scares in the United States as well, not typically for greenhouse operations, but more for field production. But this is an example on how a completely unrelated event, it had nothing to do with greenhouse production, nothing to do with crops that we typically grow in greenhouses, had a significant impact on the industry uh, to the point where we see growers going out of business. Then moving on to some future directions, and I put in this picture because I think we should always be moving forward. <laughs> but before I get into my suggestions, I, 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 I think we have to go back and look at what's going on. And so I like to show this slide uh, looking at population growth, this should well be familiar to all of you. When Professor Langhans was born, around the time we had 2 billion people living on this planet. By now we have 7 billion, and in the next uh, uh, almost 40 years or so, by 2050, we will have 9 billion people. 
I was born in 1960, so there was a, a already a billion increase compared to when Professor Langhans was born. So this is something, this is reality, this is not going to change, and this is something we have to deal with. And when I was in the Netherlands, I, I picked up on an, uh, an inaugural address, that's what they do in the Netherlands when a new professor uh, is installed in his uh, position. They give a speech, and he gave a speech, uh, talk about this issue, and he mentioned that if, if by 2050 we want everybody, the 9 billion people that will be living on Earth then, we want everybody to eat using European standards, this is probably not going to happen, but he used it as a reference point. So have the access to food and the quality uh, of the food that Europeans are accustomed to. We need to triple our production. That is a, that is a tall order. Now, I, s I said we may, not, we may not get to European levels, but that we have to increase production should be evident. And so we, this is reality. This is something we have to deal with. The other thing we have to deal with is that we're not creating more land. We have limited amount of area available to grow our crops at. And if you look at the different regions of the world here, uh, and you look at particularly at the crop lands, so the, the brownish, orange-like uh, bar here, uh, you see that we have very limited areas set aside for crop production. Uh, in fact, I think uh, on a world scale, it's perhaps uh, 0.2 hectares uh, per person that is available for crop production. And if we add more people, of course, that number becomes even smaller and smaller and smaller. So land uh, becomes a, a critical issue as well. And obviously, water is a very critical issue. One percent of the Earth's water is available as fresh water, readily available as fresh water. A lot of that, by far the biggest part of it, is consumed by agriculture. We can do a lot better in, in certain uh, irrigation systems in terms of efficiency, but at, as of now, a lot of that water that we have available is, is used for agriculture. Greenhouses, of course, allow for better control of water uptake. But nevertheless, if you look at our, our lettuce data, it requires two and a half liters of water to grow one five ounce head of lettuce. So that's a significant amount of water that we need to grow a simple plant as lettuce. Um, so the fact remains that we need large quantities of water uh, to grow our crops whether we do it in a greenhouse or not. Greenhouse production comes a long way. Again, around the time that Professor Langhans was born, we, we saw a lot of uh, uh, cold frames. Uh, obviously, that required a lot of labor. You see a large crew there working. In the Netherlands, we had uh, greenhouses specifically designed for uh, seed grapes, uh, so for, for consumption grapes. Um, and you see also some older greenhouses on the left-hand side for carnations and on the right-hand side for tomato production um, in, a, in a traditional, old-fashioned system. When Professor Langhans came to Cornell in the early 50s, um, Cornell looked something like this. You could still park your car in front of Willard Strait, and there was a parking lot on the Ag Quad. Um, by the way, uh, Ken Post was still working at the time. Here you see a picture of Ken Post. Uh, uh, from 1951, so a year before Professor Langhans came, uh, came here. And you see this, this, the state of the greenhouse. Uh, I have to add to that, when I came in the, in the late 80s, the greenhouse didn't look much different. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> some of them, some of them, obviously some of them have improved. So talking about parking, if you live in a, in a densely populated area, then you're dealing with this issue. So this is another example of the increase in population growth and the challenges that we are, are facing, uh, we are faced with uh, dealing with that increase. Going back to the greenhouses, we see lots of uh, developments, lots of technology that, that is in, in use today that really make these very high, highly sophisticated and high-tech systems. So just to name some examples, you see the greenhouse on the upper left-hand side a design that doesn't use any gutters anymore. The greenhouse is designed so that the glass panes, the very large glass panes, actually form a gutter themselves. And the trusses are not running uh, across the base, but are running in the length of the bay, actually supporting the area where normally the gutter would be. And the trusses is des the truss is designed in such a way that it provo provides a space for the energy curtain to be stored in, again, to try to maximize light transmission through this system. So there's a very... Uh, specific design features that allow for maximum light transmission in this highly 
modern greenhouse. We have sophisticated, on the upper right hand side, we have sophisticated um, irrigation systems. Here you see an entire table being moved by a computerized system to an irrigation station. The funnel there uh, would be supplied with the, the right amount of water and nutrients for the, uh, the Gerber crop to grow optimally in this, in this system. So the, the computer decides when the crop needs irrigation and then moves the table to an irrigation station uh, to provide it with water and nutrients. We have very sophisticated robots. We call them flat fixtures. The, 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 that's that that uh, make sure that every cell in a plug tray is filled with a viable plant. So there's a, a camera system that inspects an entire tray, uh, a, a mechanical system that takes out the tray, the, the cells that were not germinated or have diseased plants, and then refills those open spaces with, uh, with viable plants to make sure that when a grower sells a flat, 100% of the plants in that flat are actually viable uh, for the next stage of production. And then ultimately on the lower right hand side we have high throughput greenhouses in which plants are grown in individual containers that are, that are kept track of by a computer system so these plants can be manipulated individually uh, in the greenhouse system for, for measurements and, and, uh, and handling. So very expensive but highly uh, computerized and, and, and uh, automated systems to, to make sure we can handle plants very efficiently without uh, much human interaction. So uh, to come to some conclusions, um, I think to help feed the growing world, to me it seems greenhouse food production is, is going to be a critical component in that. Um, However, I think um, despite the need and, and I think the demonstrated capabilities, as I've tried to indicate in this talk, uh, there, there's, there's limited funding. And, and also I think we, have, we, ha we don't have the support from college administrators. That in itself could be an entire presentation, uh, but uh, I, think, I think you understand what I'm talking about. So what do we need to do? I think, I think as, an, as a group, as a, as a group of scientists working in controlled environments, we need to become stronger advocates for greenhouse production. I think we need to find a way to tell our story better and to tell it to people that really matter and that can then take action to help us with funding and help uh, uh, further the cause. Another area I think, and I strongly believe in this and where we can make improvements is to, to increase our collaborations uh, locally, regionally, but also internationally. And I think uh, you may have heard a lot of discussion recently about vertical farming. Um, I don't necessarily think vertical farming is a bad idea, but I certainly don't think it's a great idea. Um, but I think we need to come up as a, as a group with a viable alternative. In addition, and I get to back to vertical farming in a second. In addition, I think we need to look at our uh, inputs and we need to look at the, the efficient use of our inputs. We need to reduce energy consumption and waste, we need to increase the biodegradable materials, the use of them, and we need more recycling in our industry. We are working on those issues, but I don't think we, we, we do enough of it yet, because I think if we don't, outsiders will do it for us. And of course, when outsiders start looking at us, uh, they may come up with different ideas and, and different outcomes, and outcomes that may not be always in, in the, uh, in, to the benefit of the greenhouse industry. So we need to look at things like life cycle assessments of our production systems. We know we use a lot of energy, we know significant resources, particularly water, um, and we need to look at the life cycle assessment of those uh, production processes and include things like carbon footprints and, and other environmental impacts to come to a, a, a transparent and fair assessment of what we're doing. Because I think if we don't do that, others will, and others may question why we're using significant resources, for example, uh, to produce non-essentials. And I think a, a, a rose crop in a greenhouse, or perhaps even a lettuce crop in a greenhouse, could be labeled by outsiders as a non-essential crop. Uh, and I think if that happens, uh, we're going to have a long way fighting ourselves back and trying to make sure that, that those, those uh, industries remain viable. Because I think if once we get into a negative consumer uh, perception case, uh, and there are examples of that in our industry, uh, if we get to that point, it's going to be very hard to, uh, to fight those perceptions and to, uh, to get back on top again. So back to vertical farming, uh, I found this uh, uh, reference and, and uh, some pictures. 
I don't think vertical farming is a new idea. Here you see a, an, an idea by a professor in, in Australia, in Austria, I'm sorry, uh, uh, from the early 60s, looking at a conveyor system in a vertical tower, uh, trying to grow crops using supplemental lighting to help um, uh, speed up production. Uh, so I think the vert vertical farming is not a new idea. Here you see a modern version of what a vertical farm looked like in an, in an urban area. So the idea is you produce it uh, close to, to densely populated centers. You produce it in, uh, in a hydroponic system, uh, uh, but minimizing really the, the transportation distance uh, between where you produce it and where it's consumed. So is it a good idea? Um, you should ask Professor Albright to give a talk because he can give a very nice talk telling you that it's not a good idea. I tend to agree with him, um, uh, but it, nevertheless, it's an idea that's out there and it's being promoted uh, by lots of people. So I think we need to deal with it. As I said, I think we need to come up with a viable alternative to, uh, to counteract some of the forces that are trying to push, push this further. Professor Albright says that uh, an alternative might be to, to look at what he calls peri-urban agriculture, so still have food production close to large population centers, but not grow them right inside the population center, but, but, but grow them at the perimeter, so at the outside of the densely populated areas. I think that's a good idea. What I am proposing is, in addition to that, to also revisit the idea of having greenhouses attached to residential living spaces, and not thinking about this as, a, as a, an afterthought where a greenhouse is put in, in the backyard or a greenhouse is attached to a home, like a sunroom, but really uh, looking at an integration of both the greenhouse system with the living environment. So in, involve architects and designers, involve plant scientists, involve agriculture engineers that, uh, that know something about greenhouses, and sit around the table and develop a system that, uh, makes, that takes benefit of the, of the heat that's being generated by the greenhouse and use that in the building system, uh, but obviously also uh, provide for an opportunity for the family or the residents of the, the structure to grow a certain number of crops in that space to hopefully make them become less dependent on traditional supply chains. And I only have to point to the recent disaster that we had in New Jersey and New York uh, with Hurricane Sandy um, to, to come to the realization that it is important for most of us uh, to realize how dependent we are on some of these traditional supply chains and the, uh, the shock that it creates when those supply chains disappear. Um, it was a major shock and it still is a major shock to our system in New Jersey and it's going to take quite some time to overcome that. I went to the grocery store on Friday and the lights were all dimmed, there was no fresh produce and this is almost two weeks after the event, no fresh produce, um, all the cooling uh, cases were emptied there were no uh, frozen products at all in the, in the store. It, was, it felt like a third world country that I walked into. Uh, and so the disruption of, of an event like what we had, and granted this is not happening too often, but we know it can happen and we are, we are faced with it. I think that makes it all the more relevant and, and all the more critical that we look at alternative ways of providing ourselves with food and energy and other critical uh, components. So with that, uh, and with this picture that was uh, uh, made uh, several years ago by Van Gogh, that I think uh, uh, strengthens the theme that I wanted to point out to, which is local and small agriculture, perhaps we need to revisit that idea and how we can incorporate uh, small agriculture back into our modern way of living. Uh, I want to close and I want to point out that obviously I'm standing, as I present to you here, uh, on, on many tall, uh, and giant shoulders here, uh, so I want to uh, express my gratitude for all the work that was done for people that came before me, but also many colleagues that I've worked with both here and, and elsewhere uh, through my journey. So thank you very much. Aeroponics. Um, the, the only research I'm familiar with is the work that's being done in the University of Arizona, and I'm not too familiar with it. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Disney World in, in Florida has been promoting aeroponics for quite some time and have shown that it can be successful. 
The challenge is that um, if, if the system fails, if the pump doesn't pump and doesn't irrigate uh, the roots continuously, uh, you, ha you have a very short amount of time in which you can react and respond and, and overcome that issue. So in terms of having a system that can, that can deal with hiccups, which we always have in, in these complicated systems, it's, it's, it's delicate. And so I think for commercial operations, we haven't seen many people go that route, although we know that uh, if, if the system operates properly, they can be successful. Apple and lettuce? We I just looked at pure at efficiency. So I looked at the amount of light that was received by the crop and the, the dry matter production, and that's how I compared the two. So pure from an efficiency point of view. Very young apple trees or mature? Mature apple trees, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you have to go to the Monteith reference to get the details. Global seed. Correct, yeah. And so this works in the Netherlands, but it may not work here. So this is what I showed you what they were doing in the Netherlands and the, and the reasons of course is that, that scaling up for them makes sense. They have to compete with imports from other European countries particularly. And so in order to stay in business with this high tech expensive system, they, f they feel that their only way out is to, to scale up, to have more production area, uh, to become more efficient with that system. Uh, but that may not work in our case for sure, you're right. No, I, I agree with you. I, the only thing I want to add is that I think we have to be careful when we, w we use the word sustainable mm -hmm. because it means different, something different to different people. And so the, 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 the root of it is, is important and I, I agree too. But I think when I talk about sustainability, it may mean something different than when you talk about sustainability. And, and um, if we, if we want to make sure that people understand what sustainability is and from, from what point we're looking at it and, and how we use it, we need to have a common definition. And I think the definition is being slowly watered down at the moment. And so that the term is, I think, disputable. I, 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 I agree with the concept and it's important that we look at that, but uh, the wording is, is perhaps something we need to look at. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's thank AJ and get him oh. down to the press. Okay. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.